Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. Why get all your holiday decorations delivered through Instacart? Because maybe you only bought two wreaths, but you have 12 windows. Or maybe your toddler got very eager with the advent calendar. Or maybe the inflatable snowman didn't make it through the snowstorm. Or maybe the twinkle lights aren't twinkling. Whatever the reason, this season, Instacart's here for hosts and their whole holiday haul. Get decorations from The Home Depot, CVS, and more through Instacart and enjoy free delivery on your first three orders. Service fees and terms apply. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Hey guys, four-time U.S. Soccer Athlete of the Year, Landon Donovan here. And I'm former U.S. and Premier League star goalkeeper, Tim Howard. And we're here to let you know about our brand new podcast, Unfiltered Soccer. We'll be providing you with all of our insights into everything happening with the U.S. men's national team as they build towards World Cup 2026 here in North America. And we'll give you all our thoughts on the latest news from MLS, the English Premier League, international tournaments, La Liga, everything going on in the soccer world and beyond. And all throughout, Land and I will be dropping in some of our most memorable stories from both on and off the pitch. That's right. We'll take you inside the locker rooms, give you all the -the behind-the-scenes soccer info that you crave. It's our life in soccer, and it's unfiltered. Subscribe to Unfiltered Soccer on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you follow us on all your social media platforms at Unfiltered Soccer. New episodes drop every Tuesday. And welcome to part one of our interview with legend Alan Clark. Your interviewer is the Gabby Cabot. Yes, sir. Good evening, Alan, and welcome all to my 70s with a 70s legend and icon, Mr. Alan Clark. How's things, Al? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. Most people seem to think that you are a Yorkshireman, but you're an adopted Yorkshireman because your life began in the black country in 1946 on the 31st of July, didn't it? That's correct, yes. I'm a black country boy, but uh, I've been adopted by uh, the Leeds United fans, uh, so everybody thinks I'm a Yorkshireman. But I've got a Yorkshire son, and um, he was born in 1971 when I played for Leeds in my house at uh, Collingham, near Weatherby, where I lived. Uh, but as you say, uh, I'm a black country boy. And you've also got four brothers that were also professional footballers. So there was five lads all pro players, a little bit like Bill Shankly. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I'm the third eldest of mum and dad's seven children. I've got two sisters, four brothers, and I'm the third uh, eldest of the seven. And as you say, um, my mum and mum and dad's, uh, all, all the sons all play professional football, which is some record, really. They go, they're going about the Charltons and the Melbournes and what have you, but... Uh, there's a five's a bit of a record, I think. Now, where did you get your football skills from? Was your mum or was your dad very sporty? Where, 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 where's the DNA with sports and football in your family? Well, uh, my dad um, was a long distance lorry driver, like, but he, he played football in the Welsh League for Bangor City. All right. And I thought that was where the football came, but uh, I think the football did come from. Uh, my mum's uh, real dad, I mean, um, my, my, my real granddad, who I, ne- I never met, um, he played for Wolverhampton Wanderers. Right. He did, yes, and I think that's obviously that's where the football comes from. But uh, as I was told as growing up, uh, my granddad left my grandma for another woman. And obviously my mum was brought up by a stepdad. And uh, it's ironic, really, because my wife's uh, mum, she had a, a stepdad to bring her up like, and... The, my mum and my, and my mother-in-law spoke very highly of the step, stepdad. They couldn't have had a, a better dad if it had been the real dad like, but uh, uh, my real granddad, my mum's uh, real dad, he, he played for Wolverhampton Wanderers and uh, 
I often wondered when I when I turned out at, at Molyneux uh, for Fulham when I played there for Fulham uh, at Molyneux or Leicester I was there for a year and obviously Leeds United. I often wonder when I ran out at Molyneux if my my granddad was in in the in the, in, in the crowd like and I often wonder about that. He could have been. I don't know whether he was dead or what, but he could have been like. But uh, that was his fault, really. You know what I mean? Did he play many games for Wolves? And what era was it, Alan, that that, that he played there? Uh, it must have been obviously before Second World War started. Yeah. Right? But, uh, I don't know how many games he played, but obviously he did play for Wolverhampton Wanderers. My real, my real uh, granddad. And what was his name? Because we'll research that. Uh, that well, my mum's my mum's name. Uh, it was Reese. Okay. So, you know, I just imagine he, he must have been Reese, but that's what I was told anyway. He played for Wolverhampton Wonders, and, and I just, that obviously is where the football comes from. And his first name was? I don't know. Oh, right, okay. I, right. I, I, I might have told me, but I forgot it. Yeah, okay. We'll have a look into that. Your yeah. footballing journey started then at Warsaw, didn't it? You went there as a, a 16 year old lad in 1963. What uh, no, I left school uh, 61 when I was 15. Oh, okay. And uh, obviously, the week before I did leave school, uh, I was actually going to, uh, well, they called them ground staff lads in them days. Yeah. I was actually going to Aston Villa, really? who were in the top league first division. Um, Joel Mercer was the manager. And um, my last year at school, uh, they used to send me two two tickets to go and watch uh, the home matches during my last year at school. So my dad and I, every home match at Villa Park, we used to go like. And um, about a week before uh, I was ready to leave school, I, I, I came home from school and I said to my mum and dad, I said, uh, I'm not going to Aston Villa. I, I mean, during that last year as well, I used to go training with the first team squad at Aston Villa and that like Jed Eachins who uh, played for England, he went abroad to Italy. He's a striker, like myself. They had big Nigel Sims in goal. They had, a, they had some good players like Aston Villa. I used to go up every, every holiday in the last year. I used to train with them, like, but uh, um, people, what I'm going to say now, they, 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 they can't believe what I'm going to say, like, because I came home from school and I said, I'm not going to Aston Villa. Dad, I'm going to go to Warsaw because uh, when I left school in 1961 or 15, um, I was only four foot four foot five high, yeah. uh, not five foot four, four foot five. And uh, I don't know, very, they used to call me Tiny Clark when I played for my school and, and South East Staffordshire, my district uh, side and, and uh, my county, Birmingham County. Uh, I was only like, they used to call me Tiny Clark be, being so small. So uh, I went to Warsaw as a ground staff lad rather than Aston Villa. And then you progressed into the first team, didn't you? That would be 1963, I'm guessing. You played 72 games and scored 41 goals. That is an unbelievable amount. In the third division, yes. Yeah, but again, for a young kid, that is an unbelievable amount of goals. It's almost, well, it's over one every other game, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, obviously, um, I made my debut at, uh, I was 16 and a half. And uh, but when I did leave school at 15, Warsaw, they just got promotion from the third division to the second division. And uh, but obviously my first year there, they got relegated from the second division because obviously they're not a big club. They ain't got much money, and uh, they got relegated back to the third division. So I'm in like my second season. And uh, when I was 16 and a half, um, I made my first team debut. And uh, the manager at the time, um, he he played me five or six matches, but obviously I'm feeling the strain, so he he took me out to you know to give me a bit of a rest, like. But obviously he knew I'd had a, 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 a you know played in the first team. He knows I want to play more. And at 17, um, I was probably their number one striker. So instead of waiting until I was 18 to sign me professional, they signed me professional at 17. And 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 as you say, I was banging goals in the third division, but obviously. Uh, I was ambitious. I wanted to play in the top league, which is the first division. And um, in 1966, uh, I, well, I met my wife and my wife, who's she's from Nottingham and the uh, only girlfriend they ever had. And we met at Margate when I was when we were both 17. And I knew when I met her that's the girl I'm going to marry, which is ironic, really. And uh, 
we'd arranged to get married on her birthday in 1966, which um, was in the close season. Her birthday is June the 11th, and we got married on June the 11th. So uh, I'd be still 19 because I, I was like, my birthday's in the July. But uh, I had my break uh, to get into the first division, and I would have loved probably a West Midland club like Wolverhampton Wonders, West Bromwich, Yolvin, Aston Villa, Birmingham City, big clubs. I would have loved them to come in for me, but uh, I had to go out to London, to Fulham, who gave me a chance, like, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to Fulham Football Club for giving me the chance to play in the first division. It is quite incredible, because when you do look at football, and you know, you, you look back, we look forward as well, but, but when your career's finished, you look back at your career, and when you look at football, you, you probably, well, I don't think there's any probably, you're the greatest central striker that's ever come out of the West Midlands. And we missed you. Uh, well, I don't know about that, like, I mean, uh, there's a fella called Duncan Edwards, who's a Dudley boy. Yeah, but he won a centre forward, was he, Duncan? He, he was a I'll, left I'll, half. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about him if you want. But please, uh, please do, Alan. There's a, there's a. When I went into management after my career finished, I went into management. I had 12 years of it. But there's a, a there was a lad who, who used to sort of uh, work for me at uh, Barnes Football Club and Scunthorpe. I called Eddie Edwards. He was uh, the youth team coach at uh, Sheffield United. Okay. Um, where Mick Jones, who, who we formed that partnership at Leeds in the great side, yeah. who came from Sheffield United, Mick. But Eddie Edwards was a youth team coach, and Eddie often told me, because you ask people, uh, who was the greatest footballer ever? Well, you always get one in every sport. Now, for me, Pele, the Brazilian, he's the greatest footballer that ever was. Yeah. You always get one. But if you ask the same question to Eddie Edwards... It's, you'd say to Eddie, who's the greatest footballer you've ever seen? He would say Duncan Edwards. Yeah. And uh, he says he was a fully grown man at 15, 16 years of age. And apparently, Eddie was telling me, he's in charge of Sheffield United's uh, youth team and the FA Youth Cup, which is equivalent to the FA Cup, you know, with the, the professional clubs, but with the youth, it's, uh, it's equivalent to that. So Eddie says they drew Man United at Bramall Lane. And Jimmy Murphy, who was um, Matt Busby's assistant, he was in charge that night. Anyway, they actually, they actually drew with Man United, Bramall Lane, uh, Sheffield United's youth team. So obviously they're having a replay about a week or a fortnight later at Old Trafford. So Jimmy Murphy went to see Eddie and he said, Eddie, he says, your lads have done you proud tonight, but he says, when we play the replay a week or a fortnight, he says, uh, you haven't got a prayer to beat us. He said, because we've got a young man, and he says, uh, a, fella, a young lad called Duncan Edwards, he's, uh, he was 16, he says, he's a wing half, but he says, when we play at Old Trafford, I'm going to play him at centre forward. He got four goals that night. <laughs> <laughs> a great story. Great players can play in any position, I guess. That is correct. That is correct. And, and similar to John Charles, you know, at, at Leeds United and, and at Cardiff, and when he went over to uh, to Juventus, yes. uh, John was a centre half. And then when yes. Jackie Charlton came into the Leeds team, he moved up to uh, to play centre forward, and and was probably one of the greatest players at centre half and at centre forward was John Charles. That's correct. That's correct. So you're at Fulham. You're, you're banging goals in again. Forty five goals in eighty six games. Vic Buckingham was your manager, and you were a West Bromwich Albion supporter, and one of your first early memories of Vic Buckingham's team winning yeah. the FA Cup in 1954, wasn't it? That is correct. Uh, as I say, 1954, uh, my dad bought us our first television, and uh, BBC used to sort of um, cover the FA Cup final every, every, every year, like from Wembley. And uh, you can imagine there's an eight-year-old boy. I got up Saturday morning, cup final day, and the final that year in 54 was West Bromwich Albion against uh, Preston North End. Yeah. And as you say, being a West Midland boy, I was I was a West Brom fan. I think it was. I think I liked the the, the, the blue and white striped strip, like you know. 
But I didn't go, go to the Hawthorne very often from Shorty because it was two or three bus rides away. I used to go up to Molyneux in the 50s yeah. to watch Wolverhampton Wanderers. And, and to be fair, Wolverhampton Wanderers in the 50s, they were like the number one team. Like They had tremendous players like Bert Williams, Billy Wright, first hundred, he got the first 100 caps for England. Jimmy Mullen, little Johnny Hancock, he had a shot as hard as Peter Lorimer, uh, who played with me at Leeds United. Great, great players, and as I say, uh, they were a fabulous team to watch. But as I say, um, I watched West Brom and Joel being in 54, and Ronnie Allen scored the winning goal from the penalty spot. And uh, I can remember the, the captain, Len Millard, going up to the guest of honour to receive the trophy of the guest of honour, and uh, I thought to myself, well, when I grow up, I'd like to play in an FA Cup final, and, and uh, as I say, I did. I played through my career in four FA Cup finals, but I only ever won it once. Uh, but I won the big one, as I call it, the Centenary Cup final, when the Queen was there to present it to our captain, Billy Bremner. I remember it very well, and we're going to talk about that wonderful diving header from a Mick Jones cross a little bit later. We're still going to stay with Fulham a bit, because whilst at Fulham, you were playing with the great, the great Johnny Haynes, the first yeah. £100 a week football player. And Bobby Robson was central midfield as well, wasn't he? Yeah, and uh, and George Cohen, who was the right back, yeah, who was obviously played in the World Cup winning team in '66. Uh, they had a nice... Um, Mixture of youth and experience. There was actually three three lads just broke into the side before I joined them. There was a lad called John John Dempsey, a centre half. Yep. There was a lad called Les Barrett, who was a left winger. Yep. And a lad called Steve Yell, who was up front. Uh, they were similar age to me. They broke into the side a few months before I joined them on uh, transfer deadline, which is middle of March in 1966. And uh, but uh, when you look at Johnny Ains, he'd be a, him and Bobby Robson were our two central midfield players. They were both about 34 at the time, coming towards the end of the career, where I'm 19, trying to make a name for myself in the top league. Uh, and uh, obviously Johnny Ains was the king, like, I mean, first £100 a week footballer, captain England at all levels, a wonderful, wonderful player, and... Uh, I can remember meeting my new teammates uh, on the f- uh, Friday morning and uh, Fulham in them days didn't have a training ground but uh, we, we, we trained on Craven Cottage on the Friday and, and you'll never believe this though, the next day we were playing Leeds United at Allen Road yeah. and uh, I can remember Johnny Ains, like the manager says, right lads, off you go, go, get, go and get a bath, like. Anyway, uh, if you've ever been to Fulham, where you come out in the corner, like, yep. which they still do now, um, remember Johnny Ains saying, Alan, come here, son. So obviously, whatever he does, he's the king, like, you know, and he got three balls, and he says, right, I'm going to take three corner kicks. So he said, uh, tell me, at the first one, he says, what part of the goal would you like me to hit? I says, uh, near post. So I put the ball down, he had about two strides backwards and he came up, bit of bend on it. He hit the, he hit the near post. I was really impressed with that. So I says, right, the second one, what part of the goal would you like me to hit? So he did that. I says, uh, crossbar. He did exactly the same again, bit of bend on it. Two out of two. He says, right, the last one, he says, then we better get a bath because the boss will be after us. So I says, near post, and he got three out of three. <laughs> and, and when I think back, Johnny Ains was, was so good for me because I'm a striker, he's a midfield player, yep. and obviously I knew my, my runs out, you know, to get away from centre half and what have you, defenders, and he'd make this pass, and all I had to do was put it in the back of the net. I know it's easier said than done, yeah. but he was good for me, John, in that respect. But uh, what a wonderful, wonderful player he must have been in, in his prime life. But mm. he spent all his career with Fulham White. And I believe there's a statue outside Craven Cottage, which I'm looking forward to see, like, because I'm going there on Saturday uh, when they play Leeds United. One of the greats and one of the all-time greats ever to put a football kit on, 
was yes. John, Johnny Haynes, um, yes. nicknamed the Maestro. And in Jimmy Greaves' humble opinion, the best England team was in 1962 when Johnny Haynes was, was in the, the middle of the park. And I think yeah. many older people would also hold that up because Johnny, Johnny Haynes was different class. But Fulham were coming to, um, like you said, 34 and 34 apiece, Robson and Haynes. And Fulham are a club that's never really pushed on, if we're absolutely honest. But and you wanted to play at the top level. Leicester City come calling. How did that move come about? Because Samat wanted you as well, didn't he? Yeah, man. Uh, well, Bobby Robson, I played with Bobby about 15, 18 months and then he retired. Yeah. And uh, he gave me a lot of good advice, did Bobby. And uh, I thought, and he thought he had a job abroad, but he, nothing materialised from it. But, uh, we were struggling at Fulham, uh, as it, you know, as it always was like. I mean, they weren't a club with big money, or if you like. And um, I mean, it was a, a smashing club. But for me, um, they, they didn't seem ambitious enough. I think yeah. they were quite happy. This is the impression I got. They were quite happy to stay in the first division. Well, I'm sorry. Your career, your football career goes quickly now. It wasn't about money, as far as I'm concerned. I wanted to win a trophy so as you win a medal. Yep. Then by the come you, you, you end your career, you say, well, that's what I won like as a, a professional football player. Yep. And uh, they gave me the impression they were quite happy just to stay in the, in, in, in the first division, and, but I, I wanted more like so. I remember Bobby having me in his office and it looks as if we were going to get relegated that season. And he went, uh, Man United. Oh, he said, uh, although I want to keep you, he says, if we get relegated. But he says, if I get the right offer, I'll let you go, which was very good of him. Because he says, I know how hard you've worked to get in the first division. Yeah. So a few weeks later, he asked me, and he says, uh, Man United has, has offered a British record transfer fee of 150000 <clears throat> which was a lot of money in them days. I mean, yes. you look at football today, it's not even a week's wage today. They earn more than that in a week. Yeah. But it was a lot of money in them days. So I was living, my wife and I were living in Chesington in Surrey when, when I played for Fulham. And uh, he said, Matt Busby and Jimmy Murphy are coming down on the train from Manchester. So if you drive up to King's Cross and, and meet him off the train, like so, I did that. And... Uh, Everybody in the world knew Matt Busby and Jimmy Murphy. And I saw the train coming, like, and he pointed to the taxi rank and we went and got a taxi. And I saw this taxi, this, this cockney taxi man, like, he, he recognised Matt Busby and Jimmy Murphy, but he didn't know me. I'd be 21 at the time. Yeah. And um, he said, just drive around London. So he says, uh, we'd like you to sign for Man United, Alan. I says, I will, Mr Busby. And they'd got Charlton and Best at the time then. So anyway, uh, we come back and they catch the train back to Manchester. I, I drive back home to my house in, uh, in Chesington. And about a week later after that, Bobby has me in his office and uh, he says, Leicester, City, Leicester City's coming with the same bid. So um, uh, on cup final leave, uh, they used to have like a uh, Cup final rehearsal match, it would be England against young England, under 23s. Yeah. Well, I was playing for the under 23s against the world champions at Highbury. And Bobby said, The chairman of Leicester's coming to the match. So after the match, when you have a bath and got changed, go into the reception at Highbury and he'll come and see you. Like so, uh, played the game. I actually scored a couple of goals that night against the world champions for the under 23s. And I'd had a bath. Went into the reception, I waited 20 minutes. I got fed up because uh, I didn't know what the chairman of Leicester looked like. He knew what I looked like. But yeah. after 20 minutes, uh, I got in my car at Ivy and I drove back to Chessington. And uh, my wife says, I, I says, no, I says, I don't know. What, I says, I got fed up after 20 minutes. So my phone went within 20 minutes of getting in the house. This is uh, Friday evening. And it's the chairman. He says, where are we? I said, well, I waited, like, but I got fed up. He said, well, can I come and see you? I said, yes, you can. So he was staying near King's Cross Station. And uh, 
to eventually get to our house. And he says, right, I'm catching the half past nine train back to Leicester tomorrow. Would you, you and your wife, Margaret, come and meet our manager, Matt Gillis? I says, yes, we will. So we caught the train to Leicester, got to Filbert Street. I met Matt Gillis. And uh, I thought, I can play for you, pal. So, uh, I mean, when I meet somebody for the first time, I either like it or I don't. I'm not saying I dislike Matt Busby. Yeah. But I thought I can play for this guy, and um, I signed a two-year contract there and then. So at 21, I turned down Man United. So it was just a simple fact that you you really connected with the Leicester City manager, and you actually wanted to play for him for That's Leicester right. rather than Manchester United. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And to be fair. A great move because you got to the FA Cup final in 1969, didn't you? But the well, manager had lost his job during the season and you didn't particularly get on well with the uh, the incumbent manager, did you? No, I think um, that sold Gordon Banks, the goalkeeper, to Stoke yep. before I signed them, signed for them, uh, because obviously they got a young lad called Peter Shilton and they couldn't hold him back. Like, and they had a, a similar team to what Fulham had had where they got youth and experience but as you say um, halfway through the season we're having a good cup run but we're struggling in the league yeah. and the board of directors typical go and sack uh, Matt Gillis's assistant Bird Johnson and with that Matt Gillis resigned on the strength of that yeah. and I actually went round his house to ask him to change his mind but he wouldn't he's a man of principles and morals and I placed him uh, with a fellow called Frank O'Farrell, yep. uh, an Irishman, and um, we didn't see eye to eye from day one. And uh, he actually, we got to the cup final, and the day before the cup final, um, he actually pulled me to one side, and we were playing Manchester City, and they had that forward line of Summerby, Colin Bell, Franny Lee, Neil Young, and uh, Coleman, the left winger, great forward line. Yeah. And obviously they're, they're favourites to beat us, but he says to me the day before, he so I'm going to play in midfield tomorrow. Well, there's only an Irishman can do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, and from that, that was, that'd be 60, 68, 60, 69. It'd be 69, I joined uh, less than the 68, it'd be 69. And uh, they introduced where they'd have the, all the national pressmen and what have you. They voted to the like Man of the Match award, and, and there's like a trophy presented to as ever Man of the Match. Anyway, uh, we lost one nil, but all the journalists voted me Man of the Match, like on the losing side, which I don't, I don't think it's happened before on the losing side. But they voted for me to be Man of the Match, like so. Obviously, uh, from the disappointment of not not winning the cup, at least I got that like in in, in the act like. You also got the dream move as well. You joined the league champions, Leeds United, in 1969. How did that move come about, Al? Well, it came about um, at Leicester. Obviously, I played in my, my first cup final, which would be 69. Yep. And then straight after the cup final, I went with England. We toured South America because a year later, we we're going to defend the World Cup in Mexico. We won in, 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 in 66. And uh, as you say, Leeds were champions. I came back and uh, uh, Leeds United offered a... a uh, another British record of 165,000. So I brought the British record transfer fee twice within the space of 12 months. And uh, the gaffer and the chairman, and when I say the gaffer, you know I'm on about, don't you? Uh, Mr. Reeve. Yeah, because I call him, this, I would never call him by no. his name because I call him the gaffer because he was the gaffer, and that's the respect I had for him. And uh, I've always said as well, like, through my career, I've played for two of the greatest managers the world's ever seen. Yep. That's for Gaffer and Alf Ramsey, England, won yep. us the World Cup. Yep. Two great, great managers. Probably not given the credit they deserve, really, but they do from people like myself. 
But anyway, uh, I was there. The gaffer and the chairman came to my house in Leicester, and I was I was on hundred pounds a week that year at Leicester. They, they told me I was the highest paid player because they they, they paid a British record transfer fee for me. But I was on hundred pounds a week. Anyway, uh, I could have uh, asked to double the wages, like so. The gaffer comes to my house and he said uh, he's obviously done his own work. He says, how much do you earn at Leicester? I says, I'm on 100 pounds a week. And he says, well, how much do you want to come to Leeds like? Uh, and as I say, I could have asked to double my wages, but I, I asked for 10 pounds, yeah. just 10 pounds extra, 110. He says to me, I can't give you that, son. He says, all my players are on the same wage. Who, who was I to disbelieve the gaffer? I said, give me that contract. I signed a two-year contract for the same wage. Yeah. I don't think players of today would do that. But, but I actually wanted to play for Leeds United. Now, what a move that was. Because anybody that knows the football and anybody that's honest with their assessment when you look back at British football, during that period of 1965 to 1974, yes. Leeds United were the greatest team in Great Britain, and arguably the greatest team in the world. Runners-up five times, won yes. the championship twice, yes. were in four FA Cup finals, were in a League Cup final, were in a, uh, a Cup Winners Cup final, were in yes. two Fairs Cup finals, and yes. were in a, youth, in a European Cup final. My word, when and you look at that, that is incredible. And every one of us in that team were all internationals. Yeah. It was, team. it was phenomenal. 19, uh, sorry, Alan. Yeah, carry on. Now, 1970 then, uh, you've, 69 70 season was your first season. You yeah. got to the FA Cup final where you, you played Chelsea. It was the first replay um, for many, many seasons. I've got an idea. 1912 rings a bell. It was a hell of a long time that we uh, we hadn't seen a replay in the cup final. It went to um, to to Old Trafford. Yeah, well, they didn't have the replay at Wembley. We went to Old Trafford, as you exactly. Say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Everton picked you for the for the championship. So in 1970, not in 1970, you were actually going for the double. Um, we were going for the treble <laughs> in 1970. <laughs> Uh, because obviously they were league champions. And yeah. As you call the champion league today, in my day it was called the European Cup, yeah. which is still the same trophy as the Champions League. The only difference is, yeah. is to play in the European Cup, you have to be champions of your, of your country. Yeah. Today, the European Cup, i.e. Champions League, you can finish third or fourth and still play in the, in the European Cup. Yeah. All down to money. Yep. But a lot harder in my day to win the European Cup than it is today. Oh, 100%. As you said, you had to be the champions of England to be in there. And you you played... had to be champions of your country to play in the European exactly. Cup. Exactly. And you played Celtic, didn't you, in the semi-final? So we went for the, for the league <laughs> and for the European Cup and we went for the FA Cup. Now, we finished runners-up in the league. Mm. We finished... Um, Got to the semi-final of the European Cup against yeah. Glasgow Celtic, yeah. and um, we lost the FA Cup replay to Chelsea. Now we played a total. My first season, we played a total of about 72, 76 matches. Yeah. Now our gaffer always wanted his best eleven yeah. every match, and grandmas and granddads can name the great Leeds United side from Gary Sprake to Eddie Gray, the left winger. They can go through it now. Yep. Yeah. Now. We played, as I say, 72, 76 matches, runners-up in this and that, never won anything, but you never heard our gaffer and you never heard any one of his players mourning and groaning while we're playing too many matches. Yep. We just got on with the next, the next game or the next season. You understand what I'm saying? But when you come runners-up, you were a shade away from, from winning the league. For instance, in 1970-71 season, the season after, it was that game at Ellen Road where there was the offside goal and Jeff Astle scored it. In yes. 1972, the season after, again, 
going for a double and also playing in Europe as well. So arguably, for about five years, Leeds were going for a double and a treble. It was phenomenal, the success of Leeds United, wasn't it? With almost the same players as well that played in every game. If you think about from 1967 yeah. to 74, we were probably top league in the world, as you say. Um, and when you look, uh, I mean, we've just we've just actually from 67 to 74. I don't know whether you've heard about it, but Leeds City Council have actually honoured us, the Gaffer's team. They are all been given the freedom uh, of Leeds City. Uh, Leeds City. We've been given the freedom of the city. And I think that's the first team ever to have uh, won the Freedom of the City, and uh, which is obviously, we're very proud of that. The only thing with that is that it, 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 I'd have liked it to have come earlier when the Gaffer and Billy and Paul Mayley was alive. But obviously, it's a great honour to have been given the Freedom of the uh, Lee City Centre by the Lee City Council. It certainly is, and uh, I have to say, long overdue as well, because I always think that the, the, the best way to market any city is by the football club, and Leeds United, if they go on to, to play another 100 years, will not get a better team than they'll what never, they had. They'll never have a squad of players, ever. No, I don't think so. In, in the lifetime, and life, I mean, my grandson's 24, Yeah. Leeds United fanatic, but even in his lifetime, they will never, ever have a squad of players like that either, ever, ever. It's it's a one-off, that. It's a one-off. A Serbian menu. And welcome back to part two of this special podcast with Leeds United legend Alan Clark. Now, we did say that we were going to mention the 1972 FA Cup final because it was the first FA Cup final that I watched in uh, in Colour TV. You beat my team, Birmingham City, thanks very much, Alan, <laughs> on the 15th of April 1972, 3-0 at Hillsborough. You were playing Arsenal in the 1972 FA Cup final, which was um, the same as when you played in the League Cup final in 1968. And it was the same, it was the same outcome, wasn't it? You won 1-0. Daddy Cooper got the winner in the League Cup in 1968, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, and um, we beat them in the FA Cup 1-0 and I got the goal. What was it like? Because it was it was a centenary, wasn't it? I remember as a kid, we used to have little um, silver coins that that we, we put in. A, I think it was from um, Esso, a, a little booklet. Have you any recollection of uh, of those coins? Um, I remember the World Cup. Yeah, and... it was very similar to that, if my yeah. memory serves me right, yeah. I remember uh, you could you get some petrol for the World Cup and they give you like a World Cup kind and it could be like all all the squad like yes. yourself and Bobby Moore and Bobby Charlton and all that depends on what you get like so but I don't remember who they sent in with one yeah I'm I'm sure I'm sure they did because the Queen uh, gave Billy the cup didn't she in 1972 yeah. because it was the centenary oh, the Queen was there that's what I'm saying I played in four FA Cup finals yeah. but I only ever won it once, but I won the big one, the Centenary, when the Queen yeah. was there to present it to Billy Brenda. You know, the, the Queen. She was the guest of honour. And, uh, you know, I can remember my first cup final, um, Princess Anne in 69, when I played for Leicester against Man City, Princess Anne was the yep. guest of honour. But in 72, which is a Centenary, that's the big one. That's, the, that's when the Queen was there. Yeah. And what was it like scoring that goal? Because it was a magnificent diving header. Uh, Mick Jones had gone down the right, hadn't he? He was forced. I think it was Bob McNabb that he went past. He put a tremendous cross in. And you were probably about about 12 yards out. And you dived to head the ball. And it went right in the corner. 
Well, how it came about, uh, Frank McClintock and Peter Simpson were the two centre half for Arsenal, and I was at the build up to the goal. It was like I got the ball on the halfway line, yeah. about 15 yards from the touch line, and it's where the, the dugouts are, where the managers and the coaches sit. And I actually slipped, and Frank McClintock got the ball and it stood on my hand, six studs on the hand, which gives it a bit of pain like. Yeah, but it does. And I remember Frank playing Alan Ball, who was in the centre circle. He passed the ball to Alan Ball, and Alan Ball then tried to pass it to, or tried to find Charlie George, who was Arsenal's main striker. Yep. And Paul Maley intercepted the ball. He then gave the ball to Peter Lorimer, who was our right winger, he's in the centre circle. Mick Jones, my striker partner, was opposite end to me, he's over on the right wing. And uh, Peter passes it to, to Jonah. And I saw Billy them like a pass me like, and I'm in some pain here like. But anyway, I saw Billy and I thought, I better get in the, I better get in the box here. So uh, Mick's going down the right wing and Bob McNabb comes to confront him and he goes past Bob. And he just crossed the ball. I actually... I actually thought a right foot volley, and I thought I fancied the chance of it with a right foot volley. But when it when it was got about ten or fifteen yards from me, it started to dip like, and I'm thinking to myself, it ain't going to reach me. So as I say, I dived, and as soon as I headed that ball, I knew it was in the back of the net because there's many, many, many a time I've scored goals, and before the ball hit the back of the net. <clears throat> I've been like half celebrating, like whether it's come off my head, my right foot, my left foot. You, you you know it's in, like, and I knew it was in. And uh, obviously, um, it turned out to be the winner, like, and uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, you know, from from previous three occasions there on the losing, but uh, to actually win it and it was a centenary as well, it was it's absolutely magnificent. And, and so pleased for all the fans of Leeds United because, uh, you know, I can remember 65 watching uh, Leeds against Liverpool, like, and they lost that one as well. Yeah. Uh, so it was lovely for the fans to be cheering the winners on winning the FA Cup. But Billy didn't pass the cup along the line to the lad, did they? He went round with the cup and then you put him on your shoulders, didn't you? To... That's right. Pete Lyman and I picked him up, like, and... And then all the rest of the lads turned around and, and, and joined us and made a photograph. But obviously, the striking partner, Mick Jones, was in a lot of pain like he yeah. just was out of his shoulder. Like. Now, 1973, you were back to uh, back to Wembley again, going going for the uh, the, uh, the the Cup Winners' Cup, going for the league title and the FA Cup. So again going for another treble. This time you played Sunderland, and to this day, Alan, I'll yeah. still watch that shot from, was it Peter Lorimer's shot, and Jim yeah. Montgomery's save, and you still can't believe that he didn't score. Yeah, no, he should have scored. I think if we'd have got that one, then we'd have got 10, but yeah. as I've always said, the best thing to know is in the FA Cup, it's like, I know it's no cliche, but uh, you've probably heard it yourself, that says, oh, that, that, that club's name's on the FA Cup this year. Yeah. And it's a fact, like, I mean, that, that proved it. I mean, they got an early goal and defended well, but all I can say, uh, I was frustrated that afternoon. Not one chance fell to me, like, but uh, when you look at Jim Montgomery, and he, he, he made good saves, like, off Trevor Cherry and Peter Lorimer, but they should, if, 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 they, if one of them had gone in, we'd, we'd have won the call. But there you are. And I can remember going up to the banquet, and Billy Bremner, who was my roommate, teammate, and what have you, and I think I was a brother he never had. Yeah. But uh, you can imagine our wives were on the coach, and uh, we go up to the banquet because you don't get to Wembley every year, although, although it seemed that we did get to Wembley every year at Leeds United. Uh, but I'm looking through the window, and uh, I saw... Leeds United fans with the with the, the scarves on, grown up men. These weren't kids. These were grown up men crying their eyes out. And I said to Billy, "We've let them down. We've let them down." Anyway, I remember the gaffer. We pull up outside this hotel, and he says, "Right, lads, these this is what he, these are the words of the gaffer. 
He says, right, lad, he says, I know you're disappointed. You've had half good season. But he says, uh, enjoy yourselves tonight, because you've earned it. But he says, when we report back for pre-season training, because in them days, I still call it the four divisions. Yep. You know, they're like the Premiership, Championship, League, one or two. Uh, uh, for me, it's still the first, second, third and fourth division. Yep. And pre-season training, that's the hardest part of a professional footballer's season because all the hard work you put in morning afternoon to get to that that fitness and they are super fit in any era you are super fit as a professional footballer and we used to have four weeks but he says instead of having four weeks pre-season training he says we'll have five weeks and we'll sweat blood and by christ did we sweat blood but before that pre-season you'd still got the little fact of playing in the Cup Winners' Cup final in Greece. Yeah, well, I didn't play in that. No, you didn't. Neither did Billy and neither did Johnny. How come? The reason being, we played... um, I'm trying to think of the the semi-finals we played against. A good team that we're... uh, We played this team in the semi-final. I can't think of it. Where's now, Paul? Yeah. But you can look it up anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can look it up, but what a t- what a team they were, and we beat them one nil. But this centre half, who was marking me, he was fouling me all night, and I'm saying to the referee, "Come on, I want some, you know, I want some protection here." Like, and he said, "Keep playing, like." So anyway, uh, I got a goal. We we one nil up. We we're about halfway through the second half, bit 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 further than that. But one nil up, I scored the goal, and um, he comes in at me. So I get to my feet first, and I must have had a rush of blood. It's not like me to do this, but I had a rush of blood, and I just whacked him one. Because oh, yeah. uh, I was so fed up, I'd been from the start of the game. He was fouling me, fouling me. So I lost. You know, I had this rush of blood. I whacked him one, and he went too happy with it. So the referee says, oh, I'm off. And I thought, well, I'll just wait till he's had treatment, see what's happened to him. And uh, when he got up, he had his treatment. The referee sent him off. Yeah, yeah. So that proves what, what happened, right? Yeah. So obviously, I missed the second leg. Yep. And then I missed the final. Yeah. Now, the second leg, I didn't even go over I remember listening to listening to the over oh, the second leg where it was on Radio Leeds, and uh, Billy they got back to the wall. They drew nil nil. Yeah. So that meant you're in the final, and uh, we're playing AC Milan, and uh, Billy got a second. You know, got this book, second booking. That meant he would miss got yeah. Yeah. the final. So in those days, we used to have the Army Internationals. Yep, remember them well. So on the Tuesday night, as the final of the Cup Winners' Cup is on the Wednesday night in Salonica in Greece yeah. against AC Milan, I play, played for England against Wales in the Army Internationals at Wembley. Yep. And Billy has captain Scotland at Tandem Park against Northern Ireland. Now, if it, I was praying and I was listening to it in my car, in the car park at Ender Nor, where we used to stay, like with England. And if it had been a draw, we'd have flew over for the, re- you know, to for the replay. Yeah. But apparently, the lads were telling us that there again, AC Milan, when they landed, because the lads went to the airport in Salonica and saw the plane of AC Milan land, and you'll never guess who got off the plane with AC Milan. The I'd referee. Say, I was going to say, I'd say the referee would be my <laughs> guess. The referee got off them. Yeah. And some of the tackles they were doing, yeah. it was absolutely scandalous, so they're telling us. Yeah. And and, and and in the end, it was if 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 you hadn't laughed, you'd have been crying like. Yeah. It was ridiculous. But it was proven that it'd been got at. Yeah. And it was proven in the European Cup that this Frenchman, he said before the European Cup final, this will be my last match, it was proven... The V was got at. Yeah. But there was no replays. 
because it was Leeds United. Yeah. And, and, and unless you're a Leeds United fan, the rest of the world or the nation hate you. But we love that anyway. We created that because we beat everybody. Exactly. And, and that's the thing, isn't it? You know, when you have a team that's that good, it, it's a team that people people hate because they want to beat you and and uh, more more than often <laughs> they can't beat you well, what really pleases me Paul is yeah. that I think uh, as, I, as I've got older because like when I was a player when I was younger I, I mean you go on holiday with your family and I could lie in the sun all day like but as you get older uh, half an hour I, I'm thinking it's too hot like so yeah um, every time I, I go with my grandkids now and on holiday and we're all, all together and I might have a, a bit of lie in the sun for a bit and then I get a bit fed up and I thought I'll go and have a cup of tea or a glass of water or have a glass of wine or something. And people, elderly people, married couples will come up and, and they'll, they'll recognise and say, Alan, uh, I just the shake me hands. I'd like to thank you for all the pleasure you gave me when you played for Leeds United in England. Yeah. He says, this is my wife. She knows nothing about football, but she can name the great Leeds United from Gary Spray to Eddie Gray. She can name through the teams. Now, we won silverware, but we should have won a lot more. Yep. But the reason we didn't win a lot more is because... It's hard enough trying to beat opposition without trying to beat match officials. Yeah. And it was proven, but nobody did anything about it. No replays or nothing. And I can understand why our fans, Leeds United fans, wherever they go and watch Leeds United players and, 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 and back and what have you, and you lead it yourself, they'll go... Uh, Champions of Europe, champions of Europe. Yeah, we're champions of Europe because we got done by a, a, a referee who got bought by by Munich. Yeah. Definitely did. 1973-74 season with Leeds United, you went on that amazing unbeaten run, 29 games, which yeah. you, you, you was going for um, Burnley's that, record of 30. Well, that was... That was like when I said to you earlier about the Sunderland Cup final where I said to Billy, I saw them, I said, we've let them down. Yeah. And then, then the gaffer says, you've had this, is we'll sweat blood. First match of the season, I think they were playing Everton, I think. And they had some good players that that Paul Harvey, Ken, Lynn Midfield, Joel yeah. Ryan up front, uh, Brian LeBron, the captain, who will be like Gordon West, the keeper. That's some good players. And I think we were playing... Uh, Everton first match of the new season and our gaffer one o'clock team talk three o'clock kick off Allen Road right lads because like we, for that decade we were the top team like and if anybody wanted to win anything they had to get past Leeds United and yeah. he actually said to us uh, I've had a little thought during the close season he says I'd like you to go all through the season unbeaten now when you look at the, the football league then, the first division, although we were the top team, there was probably, before the season starts, there's probably 10 or 12 teams that we can win this first division championship. Yep. You ain't getting that now in this premiership. No. Because it's not a level playing field. Yep. That's the difference, not a level playing field. Money's taken over. But he says, I'd like you to go for And then we looked at each other, but... Uh, and that's when we went 29 games unbeaten. I remember Bill Shankly at Liverpool. He had a half, half-decent side at Liverpool. And he, he was not only a rival manager with our gaffer, but he was great pals with our gaffer. Yes, he was, yeah. I remember, I remember Bill Shankly uh, doing something in the paper just before Christmas. He says, if somebody doesn't know who can beat Leeds United, they'll have it won by Christmas. Yeah. So... Our 30th match were away at Stoke City at the Victoria Ground. And we actually lost 3-2. Yeah. So we've lost one game in 30 matches. But in them days, we played 42 league matches where they only played 38 now. But we played 42 in our day. Yeah. But we'd lost one. In, from the start of the season, we'd lost 
1 in 30. So our 31st match, the following week, we were at home to Tottenham, Tottenham Hotspur, Jimmy Greaves and Co. Yeah. And you know his team talk? His team talk the following week in the, in the, in the uh, players' lounge at Allen Road at 1 o'clock. This is his team talk. Right, lad. 1-800-Flowers.com knows that a gift is never just a gift. A gift is an expression of everything you feel and helps build more meaningful relationships. 1-800-Flowers takes the pressure off by helping you navigate life's important moments by making it simple to find the perfect gift. From flowers and cookies to cake and chocolate, 1-800-Flowers helps guide you in finding the right gift to say how you feel. To learn more, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in details. Last week, result, to say I was disappointed would be an understatement. Now he says, I'm going to tell you lads something. If you lads can't do the business, I'm going to get the checkbook out. We went and stuffed them six. You no need to have said that to us because that's the way they were. Yeah. But <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. But then you had a little bit of a faltering, didn't you? Because I remember Burnley went to Ellen Road and, and won four one. And and there was a couple of games I think I think you went to Anfield and, and got but you actually ended up losing four games um that season. Yeah. And and you won the uh, the football league championship. At Loftus Road, because Liverpool had got already won it by the time of yeah. the UPR. Because Liverpool had got games in hand, and remarkably, I think Liverpool lost all four of their last games, didn't they? So by yeah. the time you gone to to Loftus Road, I know the last match was at Loftus Road, yeah. and uh, when we ran out, we were champions anyway. Before we played them, like yeah. Now, in that that period of of the seventies, you you changed your, your badge because you used to have. L U F C and then you'd add an owl and then you had the kind of L U smiley face. Smiley face, you, yeah. Yeah, you got the uh, marching on together and, and, and the Leeds United football song. You also as well used to go on the pitch and wave to the crowd and you had them tie ups the tags, didn't you, on the socks? Yeah, Paul I, a lad called Paul Trevilian, he's a commercial artist, it was his idea to wear the tags. Oh was it? Blimey. And Paul is uh, a good friend of mine. He's a Tottenham fan. Yeah. But uh, he came up and had a word with the gaffer. And it was his idea. I remember the 70 Cup final against Chelsea at Wembley. We ran out with plastic uh, plastic balls, blue and white balls, Leeds colours. Right. Threw them into the crowd. That was his idea. But these, these tags we wore... Um, Obviously, you got your number on. I was number eight. Billy was number four. John was number nine. And uh, we were told at the end of every match, you just throw them into the crowd like two of the Leeds fans. And that's what we used to do. And, and you... Yeah, also, another thing, which was, which was his idea, which had never been done before, but it, like, it's been going on for years now, but we were the first team to do that. Les Cocker, our, our, our coach, come trainer, as I call him in them days, he was also the coach trainer with Alf Ramsey in England. Yeah. Uh, but this was Paul Trevelyan's idea that uh, we came out and uh, he, he sort of warmed us up like, you know what I mean, Les? Yeah. Now, you say Birmingham City's your team and we beat him in the semi-final at, at Hillsborough. I can remember Les has took us out and I can remember the, the, the trainer come coach at Birmingham City. They came out, but they were so disorganised. Trevor Francis was playing that game as well in that match. Yeah. They were so disorganised, they didn't know what they were doing. Like, But I was just organised. We're the first team to do that. Where every club does it now, every team comes out. But Leeds United, through Paul Trevelyan, we were the first team to do that. 
Wow. I didn't realise Paul Trevelyan had got such a... Oh, yeah. Yeah, such a... Yeah, we're, we're so well, well in there with, with Leeds United. Now, the gaffer has left. England have come calling and there's not many managers that turn the England job down. So he went off to uh, to manage England. <clears throat> I want to go back to 1973 after this, but Brian Howard Clough was the manager of Leeds United. Um, Don Revy wanted Billy and, and Johnny Giles to take over as joint managers. The, 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 the chairman obviously didn't listen. And Cloughy for many was the the people's choice for England and, and Brian was on he was on Mike Yarwood, he was on Parkinson, he was on everything. He'd won the league championship in seventy two. There was a little bit of needle as well. Well to say the least there was a little bit of needle because any chance that Brian could he really put the boot into Leeds. So if ever there was a manager that wasn't set for Leeds United at that time, it was Brian Clough. What was it like that first day when Cloughy walked through the door at Leeds United? Well, obviously pre-season, which as I said earlier, is the most important part of a professional footballer's season where you put all the hard work in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, typical Brian, we'd started the back a week earlier before he came. Got he was still sunning himself in, in Spain somewhere with his, with his family. Where you'd have thought, you know, he's, he's going to a new club, the importance of pre season, but typical Brian, uh, he, he went and messaged his holiday up with his family, and he came. We'd, we'd had a week before he came, like, but I'll tell you now, when he came through the door and introduced himself to us individually, and that, and wished us all the best and what have you, he was a very nervous man, I'll tell yeah. you now. Meeting us, you know, you, you think of the arrogance of Brian Clough and that, but he was a very nervous lad meeting us. I tell you, did he say that that you can get all your medals and put them in a dustbin because you've cheated? Absolutely, he said that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I would have thought that Brian would have come in there and said, look, what's been said has been said. You are the greatest team that we've ever seen in in this country. He said that after. Yeah. He said that after. He said, it's just sour grapes. Yeah. Now, if you'd have said that before, surely then he'd have got you players on side rather than winding you up and got you, you back up because he said some not very nice things. And to Eddie Gray, he was very, um, very well, scathing, wasn't he? He said to Eddie, uh, he, went, he went through all of us. Uh, Paul, Paul Rainey, great player, dirty so-and-so. I'm not swearing, but you know what I'm on yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gary Cooper, great player, Dante Sosa. Norman Hunter, great player. Again, through the law, this came to Eddie Gray. Eddie Gray, he says, for how long have you been at this football club? So he says, you should have, should have played a lot more matches. Now, Eddie, Eddie Gray used to have, like, muscle problems. And yeah. Cost him, you know, he, he didn't play a lot of matches. And that's, you know, when I hear somebody... Say that player's injury prone. I think I don't like that word. I think yeah. you're either lucky or unlucky with injuries. Yes. And Eddie was seen as a as a young young lad. He had this muscle injury. So I, I mean, Brian, when he said that, it, it, it's 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 quite funny, really. But I think that day he found out how close we were. Like because when he said that to Eddie, he said, "If you if you'd have been a racehorse, young man." He'd have been shot five years ago, which is quite funny, but like yeah. we didn't find it funny. Yeah. And I think he found out that day how close we were to each other. Because you were literally a band of brothers and, and, and Don well, Reddy. The, gaff, the gaffer created that. He created yeah. a family. It was a family. And, I, and when I say family, everybody like who worked for the gaffer, backroom staff, coaches, uh, like lads who uh, went and, and, and reported, watched teams and what have you. Everybody in the administration, the secretary, it created this family atmosphere. Yeah. And we were one big, we, one big family. And and to be fair, we've just been given the freedom of Leeds City, City 
uh, not only the players, but everybody connected with the club, the administration side, the coaches and the family, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was a one big family. He created that big up. And you can catch part three of this fascinating series with Alan Clark shortly on SRB Mia. Now, why do you, in your honest opinion, Al, why why do you think Cloughy failed? I mean, there's people that says he didn't have the players on his side, the players wasn't playing for him. The, 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 the Leeds United team, you were all getting to a certain age and probably one or two players would be moved out within the next few seasons. But Brian, if memory serves me right, I think did he bring in Duncan McKenzie, um, John O'Hare and, and John McGovern quite yes. quickly? Was was it just too much too soon? What What's your opinion? I, I, I think, looking at Brian, how, um, well, Brian's Brian is arrogant. Yeah. He'll say he's arrogant and what have you. And he'll call a spade a spade and what have you. Yeah. I have nothing against that. I, I mean, I, I tend to be like that if, if yep. I was honest. And I, I'd rather have people like that than someone who are two-faced and what have you. Yep. But the way I look at it, I think Brian Clough was the right manager at the wrong time. Yep. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that that great side, and I'll tell you now, call me biased, but that's one of the greatest teams this country has ever seen, ever likely to see. I, I, I agree. Because when you think about it, and they go on about Alex Ferguson with the famous six, if you like. Mm. Well, let me mention the famous Gary Sprague, David Harvey, Paul Reaney, Terry Cooper, Jack Charlton, Norman Hunter, Peter Lorimer, Billy Bremner, and Eddie Gray. Now, I don't know how many I've counted there, but if you look at that lot mm-hmm. I've just mentioned, compared with the famous six, I know I would have in my team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I would have in my team. Mm-hmm. Now, that great side, only three players he bought was Jarosy from Man U, yep. Mick Jones from Sheffield United, and me from Leicester City. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, when you look at that, now... When Brian came in, as I said, he was the right manager at the wrong time. Yep. Now, if he'd have come, because we're all getting older yep. by the time he came, right? We're all getting older. So if he'd have come when majority of that Gaffer's team weren't there anymore, yep. it would have been a lot better for him, if you know what I mean. I do, yeah. yeah. Because how do you better what he's done for that club? You, very, very difficult. You almost can't. I remember the famous interview with um, with, with Don Revy and Brian Clough on at Yorkshire TV. And, and Brian says, well, I wanted to win the league better than you did. And he says, well, yeah. you, you can't. Uh, you can't. And, and and for what Leeds United did, I mean, we said that at the, the uh, early part of the show. When you look at the runners-up when they won the league, every, everything, everything, everything that Leeds won... Almost impossible to replicate that or better that, like you said. Do you think that was one of the reasons? That... I'll tell you another thing, Paul. If, while I'm remembering, because yeah. I tend to forget it like at 73 years of age. <laughs> but, you know, like the FA Cup third round draw. Yep. It used to be on the radio. It's on television now, but it used to be on the radio on a Monday, Monday lunchtime, didn't it? Yeah, it did, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? Yes, I, yes no, I do, yeah, yeah. Which well, this is, when the FA Cup third round, where the first and second division clubs come into it, like with third and fourth and yep. non Well, across the road from Ellen Road, there used to be a calf called Sheila's Calf. Yeah. Which ended up, Terry Yorath went out with the, the daughter of the people who owned the calf. Right. But we called it Sheila's Calf. Now, 
after we finished training, all of us used to go into this cafe, but like we go into the back room, which is like like their lounge, the owner's lounge, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And the 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 the, the, the make us a cup of tea and that, and we'd be listening. All the players after training. That's how close we were. We'd listen to what who, who we've drawn like. Yeah. All the time. I mean, that's the spirit of the club. We were, we were like one. If if anybody kicked one of us, we all we all bled. Yeah. You know what I mean? And with with Don Revy going to manage England, and, yeah. and Brian had said in that interview, you must have been so close to going to England because. I think you wanted a pop at the European Cup. And Don Revy said, yes, you're absolutely right, I did. Yeah, that's right. Being hypothetical, and we can't do that because you were all of a certain age, if if it was, if you were all, say, in your mid-twenties rather than your late-twenties and, and the team was almost ready to be broke up, I personally, looking from the out, looking in, I don't think Don Revy would have liked to have broke you up with the closeness of Leeds United and well, I think Billy always said this yeah um, and and I, I I tend to agree with him is mm-hmm. that the gaffer he, he he couldn't have said to any of us well I'm not going to pick you anymore yeah. son. and I and I think you, you're right you, you, you're thinking that you're all yeah. right he wouldn't have wanted to do that mm-hmm. he wouldn't have wanted to do that I mean no that's our close one. We're, we're yeah. like family. Yeah, I, I don't think there's again been a, a club as as close as what you know Leeds United were because I mean you used to play carpet bowls and bingo and it was Absolutely. something that Don Revy brought to England, but it didn't work with them players because they some things you can do with the club side you can't do with the international team, can you? Because of course you can't because you haven't yeah. seen about six times uh, exactly. Since. Well, you're seeing them every day. Exactly. I mean, I can remember uh, we're going for the league. Well, we went for the league every year, but yeah. uh, we're coming towards the end of the season. I can remember we we're, were playing Newcastle on the Saturday at St James's Park. Yep. So obviously we've gone off on the Friday from Leeds to Newcastle. Yep. <clears throat> I think on the I think on the Tuesday night we played at Newcastle on the Saturday. On the Tuesday night, we got Arsenal. Yeah. And I think Arsenal were just above us or somewhere, but if we, if we beat them, and I think Big Jag got the winner, so we went above them, but on the Tuesday night. Now, we've gone from Friday up to Newcastle. Yeah. Played Newcastle at St. James' Park on the Saturday. Instead of coming home to go home to your wife for the weekend because they were playing Tuesday, no, no, this match towards the end of the season, from Newcastle, we went to... Uh, Ilfley, which is near Osset, to this hotel we used to stay at. We went there. Our wife came to see us on the Sunday at this hotel yeah. as we were playing Arsenal on a Tuesday night. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Le- Leeds were different class. Your, yeah. in- your England career, because we've got to we'll touch upon that before I get into some more basic My 70s questions, a bit more quick fire. Your first game for uh, for England was your debut in the 1970 World Cup finals. It was certainly your first goal, Czechoslovakia, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, I remember. I remember um, making my under 23 debut in '67. The Fulham player, and uh, fully enough, we were playing against Wales under 23, and uh, we were playing at Molyneux, Wolverhampton Wonders ground, really? which which is in the West Midlands. And I used to go up to Molyneux in the 50s, like, to watch them. And uh, I can remember it would be the Wednesday night, but Tuesday night, Warsaw, where I started, they were playing an home match in the league at Fellas Park. They've got a different ground now, Warsaw, but they're playing at Fellas Park. And Alf took us to Fellas Park, Alf Ramsey, and uh, I had a photograph with the chairman, uh, uh, Bill Addison, his name was, and his son took over before I left. And uh, I saw a gas, and uh, on the on the Wednesday night, uh, I made my debut with the under-23s against Wales, and we beat them eight, and I got four goals on my debut. Anyway, I was then, uh, I was play- banging goals in for the under-23s. I was included in every full squad, because they are the world champions, like. Yeah. But 
I never got a game. Yeah. So I can remember going out to the, the World Cup in Mexico and I said to my, my wife, Margaret, I said, I'll tell you what, if I don't get a game in these championships, I said, if it picks me next year, I'm not going to go. Because when you look at the under-23s, which is under-21s now, it's the same as under-23s, you'll see a lad, even in my day, probably not so much my day, yeah. but after all, if you like, uh, whoever's, uh, they make progress from the under-23s to the full squad. They get a cap straight away. Yeah. So I've been going from 67, we're now seven, 70, mm-hmm. And I said to Margaret, I said, if I don't get a, I'm not going again. Anyway, we're, we're, we're based in a place called Guadalajara. We're in a nice, easy group of uh, Brazil, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. I'm being sarcastic <laughs> I now. I know you are. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the day before, because I, I, did, I did have uh, gastroenteritis while I was there. I, when we were playing Brazil, um, I was in bed with gastroenteritis for that. Mm-hmm. But anyway... Uh, the day before the Czechoslovakia game and we needed a win to qualify for the quarterfinals. So he pulled me to one side and he says, uh, Alan, he says, I'm going to play tomorrow. So I went, oh, and I thought, gosh, this, that's great. And then he says to me, I think you're ready now, son. I went, oh, I've been ready for three years, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we're having a team meeting, day of the game, and obviously I'm making my debut, although I've been with them since 67, so I'm all familiar with them. But he says, right, he says, uh, if we have a penalty, because I, I would have volunteered straight away, like, but I'm making my debut, but I'm thinking, well, a more experienced player will probably volunteer straight away, like, and he said, if we have a penalty, he'll take it. Well, nobody was volunteering, like, and I said, I'll take it off. He said, good lad, because it seemed an eternity before I said, I'll take it, like, because I was waiting for a more experienced player, like. But anyway, he said, uh, I said, I'll take it. He said, good lad. Anyway, as I was, I, I scored from the pen, we won one nil. And Les Cocker, our, our coach at Leeds, after I got out of the bath, he went, Alan, he says, uh, you know when you're taking it? He said, oh, it's funny. I said, what are you about, Les? He said, uh, you know when you're placing the ball on the spot? Because he sat with uh, Alf in the dugout. And Al Shepardson was the middle of the coach. He was the other trainer. So he says, uh, Les, he says, will Alan score? <laughs> so Les says, you want Alf? He says, will Alan score? So he says, I said to Alf, he says, Les, uh, Alf, you can put your mortgage on him. He won't miss. I sent him the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely story. Another penalty that you didn't miss no, was I, against I, I Poland. Sent, I sent the wrong way as well. And Cluffy called him a clown. He got voted uh, goalkeeper of the tournament in West Germany. Domaszewski. That was an unbelievable night, wasn't it? I remember watching that. I'd, I was about eight years of age. We only, have, we only had to win one nil, two one. We one nil down, like no pressure under a thousand watching, like you know, at Wembley. But I sent him the wrong way. But it was an amazing night. We had so many chances, didn't we? And Tomachevsky made some great saves, and then other times the ball had hit him on any part of his body. As you say, Cluffy called him a clown, but yeah. he did have the game he of his life. The top in that tournament, yeah. In yeah, but they they were they were Olympic champions going into the tournament, and, and say in the World Cup they I think they come third in the World Cup as well. Poland were a damn good side. But Don't you know that was one of the most one-sided international match I ever played. It was. Yeah, hundred percent. And I tell you what, it took me at least three or four weeks to get over that disappointment because the next day at my house in Leeds, I was I was I was arranged to do a television commercial for NatWest Bank. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I was so sick of the parrot. I couldn't do it. It was incredible that England didn't qualify, and, and we didn't qualify till 1982, with all the great players that we had. Well, all, all four we said, they won the World in 66, but in 1970, his squad was stronger and better, he said. And he went on record saying that all family. Now, the nickname Sniffer, that come from a football-focused presenter, didn't it? It did, I. Um, um, you know, on Saturday, what did they have that uh, at lunchtime? They yep. still do it. Football Focus, yeah. Football Focus, I. Mm. There was, uh, I nearly had his name then. Sam somebody. I met him when Sa- I played for home. Sam. Sam Leach. 
Because it's Sam Leach. He was a Scottish lad, wasn't he? I'm not too sure because he's a little bit before my time, but it's spelled well, L-E-I-T-C-H. It, I met him. He, he was based in London, and, and, and I, I met him when I played for Fulham. Sam, he was a stockiest. He was definitely a Scottish lad, but yeah. he was he was um, he used to he used to use football focus. Well, our gaffer, we always like to watch football focus, which comes in at half past twelve till one o'clock. Or whether we're playing at Allen Road on a Saturday afternoon or if we're playing away from home, we'd be in an hotel. So we'd have a, a, a room just for the players and that. And the gaffer, he, he let us watch Football Focus and he'd have his team talk at one o'clock in the hotel or in the players' lounge at Allen Road. So we're playing Man United. I'm in the second season now. Yep. And uh, this is where the name Sniffer came from. So... We're in the second season. We play Man United, John Lord and Best of Allen Road in the league match. So, Sam, it is Sam Leach. You've got his name there. It is Sam Leach. Yeah. So he said, um, oh, he says, Leach, and we all sat there quietly, like. So he says, uh, League United against Man United, Allen Road this afternoon. Now he says, the, the player that Man United will have to watch is uh, Alan Clark. And he shows you my first season banging a few goals in for Leeds. So when the cameras went back in the studios in London on him, it's all quite like, and he says, because like my nickname when I went there, because everybody got a nickname, because I was six foot, they used to call me Big Al. Yeah. Well, no, as thin as a ray, they used to call me Big Al, like that was my nickname, Big Al. So he says, uh, so when they show you these goals, he says, that's why his teammates call him Sniffer. Well, they just burst out laughing like, and it stuck. <laughs> and and everybody, and I mean everybody, even the gaffer, and and even the away teams and that, like, call me Sniffer. That's where I got it from. It was his fault. Did you yeah. like that nickname? Pardon? Did you like that nickname, Al? Oh, I didn't dislike it. I mean, it, it, it's like uh, it's just like a compliment. I sniff goals yeah. at. <laughs> but you didn't just sniff goals. You, like you scored. Great goals as well as sniff them in the in the six yard box. I think I think when I hear people now, when I see people and that, yeah. and it, it is it is right. I mean, with the when you, when you're kicking a football ball, yeah. yeah, you know when you 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 go for power and you you you, you drive it, yep, yeah. you go for power, but the side of your foot, yep. Yeah you can get more accuracy than if you're trying to go for power. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, yeah. Billy had a gift about this thing, but I could hit a ball with the side of my foot as hard as if I'm, like, with my instep, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it must have been a gift I had, because Billy says, I can't believe how hard you hit the ball with the side of your foot, and you get more accuracy. Yeah. But I've heard people refer to me, they says, if you ever saw Alan Clark, he says he passes the ball into the net, yeah. and that is correct. And you don't see too many strikers who've got that. In fact, I ain't seen anybody. Pace, you know what I mean? Pace and place. Yeah, but you get more accuracy yeah. because I've, I've seen from the edge. I've, I've scored goals from the side of my foot, just outside the eighteen-yard box. Yeah. But I've hit the target where from there, twelve yards out, they've gone for power. It's like. Been better than the bloody rugby, the rugby goals, like he's miles over. The goal for power, pass it, and I did pass the ball in the net, left foot or right foot. And that's it, you were dual footed, wasn't you? You'd score goals with your head, with your left foot, and your right foot. Have you yeah, any... but the thing is, though, when I left school and I joined Warsaw, yep. like when, when you're born, you're either left footed, right footed. Yes. I was a natural right footed, and when I was at school, night and my teacher never. Never said about, oh, practice with your left foot, Alan. I just did what I did, like right footed. Now, when I joined Warsaw, I used to get the coach saw that I couldn't kick with the left foot. And to be particular as a striker, and as, as Paul Trevelyan calls, calls, he don't say I'm a striker. He says, he's a finisher. Yep. Big difference. He's a finisher. He calls me a finisher, not a striker. Were you were you were one of the greatest finishers that we've ever seen in in well, British football? Uh, well, well, um, 
I was up, um, it's our centenary year this year at Leeds United. And yes, yes it is. United Trust Fund, they've hired a, they hired a, this shop in the Merrion Centre in Leeds for yeah. a month, showing the memorabilia. Anyway, the chairman invited me to go and tour to the fans and what have you. Yeah. And also in, invited Paul Trevillian. So I was with him a few weeks ago. I love it. He came up and... Uh, he just says, he says, he's not a striker, he's a finisher. And he says, I tell you now, he says, this is Paul Trevelyan talking to yep. all the fans, the real fans. And he said, uh, I'm a good friend with Jimmy Greaves. Yep. And now he says, Jimmy Greaves envies Sniffer Alan Clark because he says, he scored the winning goal. Now he says, Jimmy's played in the cup final. But he hasn't actually has scored the winning goal. He's like, there's, there's been more goals in it, if you like. But yep. he says, he actually won 1-0. And he got the goal. And he says, I really envy Alan Clark. This is Jimmy Grease telling Paul Trevelyan. Is it a favourite goal that, that you scored? I mean, one of my favourites of yours was, I think it was Tommy Doherty's first game um, for Manchester United as as the new manager. And the ball's come out. You've picked it out the sky, I think, with your right foot. You've turned and you've just... Was that at Old Trafford? Yeah, it was at Old Trafford, yeah. That was a, it was right. a tremendous goal, that was. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a favourite, Alan, that, that you scored out of your many, many goals for, for Leeds in England... It's- uh, you know, in answer to the question, there's like every goal I scored, I enjoyed every one of them. Yep. Every one of them. But I mean, the, the, the Leeds fans, obviously, the goal at Wembley, whether it's a diving header, whether it's a right foot, left foot, yep. it's the only time we've won the cup. They'll always remember that. But like. It took a lifetime to find the person you want to marry. Finding the perfect engagement ring is a lot easier. At BlueNile.com, you can find or design the ring you've always dreamed of with help from Blue Nile's jewelry experts who are on hand 24-7 to answer questions and the ease and convenience of shopping online. For a limited time, get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more with code LISTEN at BlueNile.com. That's $50 off with code LISTEN at BlueNile.com. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass!" So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in details. They're all important to me. Yeah. Um, it's like we were one each against Barcelona. First leg of the European Cup at the Ballon Road, and I got the win it. Made it two one. We took a lead over to the new Camp. It's important. But I can remember like my first visit to Anfield. I was playing with Fulham, and and I think Liverpool that year won the league. But there was Johnny Ains, George Cohen, Bobby Robson, Graham Leggett, youth and experience. We beat them two 0 and I got both goals. And my second goal, I went on a run about ten yards. I picked the ball up ten yards inside Liverpool's half. Opposite end the cop, opposite end the cop, and I went past Tommy Smith, I went past Chris Lawyer, and uh, Tommy Lawrence, the keeper, I did him on his near post. And I remember when I got back home on the Sunday at my house in Chesington, I remember reading the report on it, and Bill Shankly, the manager, says, Alan Clark's second goal is one of the finest goals I've ever seen at, at, at Anfield at that time. So the, 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 some of the more special than others, but to me, all goals, I enjoyed every one of them. If you could replay one game that you've ever played in, what game would you replay and why? Uh, well, I think I'm in my, my second season and we're playing Burnley in a league match at Allen Road. Yep. I think it's my second season. And uh, the scoreline was uh, Alan Clark 4, Burnley 0. We beat them 4 0. Got all four goals. Wow. And anyway, it won't happen today. But it did in them days anyway. You can imagine journalists, national journalists, local journalists, yeah. like Yorkshire Post, Evening Post. But um, I can remember Les Cocker and this journalist, a fella called Vince Wilson. He's a Geordie. He's big mates with Brian Clough, Vince. A yeah. lovely, lovely man. 
he died uh, a few years ago, but he, he was living in Cheshire and he used to go over there and he'd come over here, him and his wife, looking a big mate with Brian Clough. And he, he loved strikers, did uh, the Vince. So uh, reporters and that, they couldn't get anywhere near the dressing rooms now, but they did in them days. But anyway, Les Cocker, this is what Vince told me after. Les had gone out to get some ice from the treatment room to bring back to the dressing room. And uh, Vince says, uh, Les and, and, and Vince knew, uh, Les knew Vince. Like. He went, Les, he says, hello, Vince. He says, listen, he says, uh, I need I need to talk to Alan Clark. He scored four goals, like, you know, he don't score four goals very often. So he says, Les says, oh, he's in the bath. So he says, go in the dressing room. He, 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 he says, what? He says, you, you can go in the dressing room. He says, he'll get out of the bath in a minute. So when I come out walking out into the dressing room from the bathroom with some of the lads, I saw this fella and I'm thinking, who the hell is he? He sat in where, where, where my clothes are, like, to put my suit on and that. Anyway, he said, well, my name's Vince Wilson. He says, um, I write for the Sunday Mirror. But he says, uh, you've scored four goals like you don't score. He says, I wonder if you could just take me through it. And, he, and the way Vince Hughes went on with him, he said, the way he just went bang, 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 and, and he just, as if it's easy, peasy, peasy, like. And we became great, great pals, you know. Right. And uh, as I say, he, was, he went to Nordy, I mean, Nora with uh, Barbara and, and, and Brian. And, and actually, Brian Clough, Vince told me this, uh, when Cloughy and Peter Taylor of Forest, they were playing either Liverpool or Everton. So Vince, where he lives in Cheshire, he's not far in Manchester, he used to go across and see him. And he's having a bit of, this is a Friday night, he's having um, a, bit of, a bit of meal with Brian and Peter. So Cloughy says to Vince, he says, uh, Vince, how much do you owe uh, on your mortgage like? He went, what? He says, how much? You owe on your mortgage to your house. So Vince says, I told him a figure. He says, excuse me. So he says, he's left me with Peter Taylor. He comes back and thousands of pounds what he owes. He says, there's a cheque. He says, pay it off. He went, you pay his bloody mortgage off. Flipping heck. <laughs> you know, you don't see that side of other people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, he paid Vince's bloody mortgage off, Brian Club, because... He writes for the Sunday Mirror, and Cluffy used to have a, a column every Sunday, like, through Vince, and he's earning money off that, like, so he's just repaying him, if you like. <laughs> Unbelievable. But Cluffy was a very generous person. Oh, yeah. He? You know, he, he, he could cause an argument in a telephone box at times, but blimey, was Brian Clough a very, very well, generous he, person as well? Paid his bloody mortgage off. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Have you got any any lucky ground that you played on, Al, or any unlucky ground? I always like playing at Anfield. Okay. Even with Fulham, because I think I think uh, the, the impression I got, and as I say, my first visit, and we won two 0 Yeah. Both goals were Fulham, but obviously, like all, which you have a club you support, you want your team to win every match, which you hope to do, but they don't. But even at Anfield. Uh, the Liverpool fans, what I noticed on my first visit, you play good football, they will applaud you. Yes, yeah. You know what I mean? So that impressed me, that. So I always look forward to playing at Anfield. If you could have a conversation with anyone, a one-to-one with anyone, dead or alive, who would, mm. it, be, who would it be with? If I could have what? Uh, a conversation, a cup of coffee, a beer, a cup of tea, a one-to-one conversation with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be with? Really? Sorry? Billy Bremner. <laughs> you were very close, wasn't you? You and uh, you and Billy. Yeah. I think I was the brother he never had. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, since he's passed away, which is about 22 years, I think, now. Yeah. I wake up and every day of my life, I, I think about Billy some part of the day and I go to the day I die. And I've always said they don't make players like him today. What, what, was, what was special? What was different about Billy Bremner? Because, I mean, he was a great midfield player and he scored a lot of goals from midfield play and sure. also a lot of important goals for Leeds United, didn't he? Absolutely. And, uh, he, 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 I mean, people say to me, 
Who was the best player you ever played with or against? Well, I played against Leeds before I joined Leeds. Yep. <clears throat> and I played with some great England players, i.e. Bobby Moore, Gordon Banks, Alan Ball, Bobby Charlton. But for me, best player I played with and against, Billy Bremner, without a shadow of a doubt. He got absolutely everything, world class, absolutely. I mean, as you said, he scored a lot of goals for Leeds United and yeah. he scored a lot of vital goals as well. Um, he just had, he'd got everything. I mean... If you saw Billy in training, pre-season, we used to go on like five-mile runs yeah. to get stamina. The, the gaffer used to give him a 15-minute start before he set us off because he, he weren't interested. Yeah. But give him a ball, put a ball to his feet, he'll run all day. Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference. Unbelievable. What's your most prized possession from your playing career? My best pride, I think. <laughs> well... It's, that's a difficult one because everything, everything's got its... I mean, obviously, I did win the league. Yeah. I won the FA Cup. I would have loved to have won the European Cup. Yeah. But, well, as our fans shout, Champions of Europe, I'll, I'll go along with that. Yeah. But, um, and obviously, like anybody, as a professional, to represent your, co- uh, your country, you can't ask any more than that. I mean, I was so proud making me under-23 debut against Wales at Molyneux, but to play, to make me debut for the full team in a World Cup in Mexico to retain it, it is even better like. So whatever sport you do, to represent your country, you can't ask any more than that. Yeah, absolutely. But that's very proud. The only, the only thing that I regret is that I should have had more caps when I was all from this number one, but... Uh, I've got 19 caps. I'm, I'm claiming 11 goals, but it might uh, show me 10. But I, I played against Austria and I'm claiming an hat-trick. But they said I got two, but I'll claim an hat-trick. No. So, bad, but... Um, do do those goals against Scotland in the in the centenary game of 73, that the brace you scored, are you counting those as well? I think so. I yeah. don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, because you had a goal disallowed against Scotland in 73, and then when you played up at Hamden uh, yeah. for the centenary game, you scored a couple. We beat them 5 0. I think you scored two. Martin Chivers scored. I think it was Mick Shannon's first goal for England as well that night. Jimmy Grace played that night as well. Did he really? Glock? I Grace really played with me that night as well, and uh, Billy let Scotland out. Yeah. And I don't know whether I've told you the story about Billy, have I? What one was that? Go on. If, we, if you haven't, tell me. No, well, towards the end of the game, we're five up or something like that. Yeah. And Martin Peters plays me a ball, but it's not coming to me quickly. And I saw Billy Bremner take off like, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead here. <laughs> but I wanted to lay it off to Bobby Charlton, but I can't shy away from it. Yeah. Because they'll say, oh, he's chicken, Clark, you like. But I couldn't shy away from him. I saw Billy take off. But anyway, when he got about five yards off me, he, he just pulled up a bit. Yeah. So I'm able to, to knock knock it off to uh, Bobby Charlton. I spun around. And anyway, the next day, we're all flying back from Glasgow Airport to Leeds Bradford Airport. And I think uh, Paul Madeley played that night as well in uh, for England. And... The, the Scottish lads, there was Billy, Eddie Gray, David Harvey, I think, played that night. Although he's as English as you and I, uh, and, and Eddie Gray. So we meet at the Glasgow airport. So I went, uh, morning, Bill. I says, uh, he went, morning, Bill. I says, how are you? He says, how am I? He says, uh, just got goody stuff last, last night. So I says, Billy, tell me. I says, uh, you know, just before the end of the game last night, I says, uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Charlton played me this ball or whatever it was. And I says, I saw you coming towards me and then you eased up a bit and let me knock the ball off. So he says, Alan, the game was over, son. And he says, on Saturday, we're playing for Leeds United and he says, I need you to get the goal to get a bonus like. But he says, I'll tell you something else, son. You know, if the scoreline had been nil-nil, you'd have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely story, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the way it was. Yeah. That's the way it was. Is there any player of the 70s that you would have loved to have played with yeah. that you didn't? I think I played with him at Leeds United. Yeah. Uh, and then with England. Yeah. Don't need any more. Didn't need any more. 
Any songs, song or songs, that evoke memories of your playing career during the 70s, Al? Was you a big music fan? Oh, I like the music. Yeah. I mean, when we used to have uh, dues, uh, the gaffer, we all had to sing, you know, we all we used to have like a sing song. We all had to sing individually. Okay. And uh, I used to go, catch a falling star and put it in your pocket, never let it fade. And I used to do the actions like. Yeah. And you know what Billy's was? Go on. I'm nobody's child. I'm nobody's child. You haven't got a brother anybody like. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like to sing song. Now, yeah. the, there was in the shoot. Do you remember the shoot magazines? The, uh, they used to have a, a focus. I do. I, I, I did a, bit, a few articles in that. Yeah, you did. Well, we're going back to one. It was about 1974. It's a bit of a quick fire here. So it said, in 1974, 75 season, who was your favourite player? What answer did you give? Uh, Christ. Was it Dennis Law? Dennis Law, yep, absolutely spot on. Dennis Law. Who did you say was your most difficult opponent to that date? Mike England, Tottenham. Sorry? Mike England, centre half for, for Tottenham. Another Tottenham player, Phil Beal. Phil Beal, yeah. Yeah, Phil Bill said, most memorable match. What answer did you give back in the mid-70s to that question? Oh, I can't remember. Too many to mention, which is pretty much what you, what's you what come through in this interview. Your biggest right. thrill, what did you say was your biggest thrill in football? Winning the cup. Winning your first England cap. Ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Biggest disappointment? Losing European Cup. Losing the 1973 FA Cup final. To be fair... At that stage, you may not have played in the European Cup final. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, best country that you'd visited, what was your answer back then in the mid-70s? San Francisco. Yeah, you did say, yeah. Best country visited, America. Miscellaneous, yeah. miscellaneous yeah. likes, what did you? What was your three answers to your miscellaneous likes? I don't know. Golf, tennis and... Golf, tennis, golf. Music. Music. What person would you most like to meet in 1974-75, who did you say back then? Tell me. Jack Nicholas. Yes. Your two favourite artists were in the Shoot magazine, Football Focus on Alan Clark. Two favourite artists, one was male, one was female. Right, go on. Shirley Bassey and Gilbert O'Sullivan. Yeah, yeah. And your two favourite TV shows were... Go on. Match of the day and probably the best double act apart from you and Mick Jones. Who was that? Morkham and Wise. Yeah, I used to like them, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Al, can I thank you so much for your time, sir? It's been an absolute pleasure walking down uh, memory lane with you and uh, revisiting those halcyon days of the golden age of football, the 70s. Marvellous. Um, is, is, is it going to be in a magazine, this? It will be on a podcast, and um, we'll send it over to you. If you can send us a, a copy of it or something like that. I've got your proper mobile number now. There's a picture of you and Billy when Billy was playing for Leeds, and mm. you were playing for Fulham. Have you got that photograph? Don't think so. No? Well, I sent it to your old mobile phone number. I'll send it to your new one and uh, perhaps you can take it off and print it out and uh, stick it up there in your front room I'll either get my wife or my daughter because I'm not very technical I can't do things like that definitely we'll, we'll link up and we'll do that cheers Al you take care cheers mate those Thanks. were the days my friend not the best days absolutely yeah. Th thanks cheers. Al god bless cheers bye. Al bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. <laughs> If there's one thing that my family and friends know me for, it's being an amazing gift giver. I owe it all to Celebrations Passport from 1-800-Flowers.com, my one-stop shopping site that has amazing gifts for every occasion. With Celebrations Passport, I get free shipping on thousands of amazing gifts. And the more gifts I give, the more perks and rewards I earn. To learn more and take your gift giving to the next level, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Every idea starts with a problem. Morby Parker's was simple. Glasses are too expensive. So they set out to change that. 
By designing glasses in-house and selling directly to customers, they're able to offer prescription eyewear that's expertly crafted and unexpectedly affordable. Warby Parker glasses are made from premium materials like impact-resistant polycarbonate and custom acetate. And they start at just $95, including prescription lenses. Get glasses made from the good stuff. Stop by a Warby Parker store near you. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be.